Welcome to another episode of Before You Kill Yourself with your host, Leo Flowers. Today's episode is brought to us by BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. Just like if you were stranded on an island, you would write, help! Is there something interfering with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? For me, it was comparing myself to others, not feeling like I'm enough, and being afraid to express my needs. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. BetterHelp is also committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed anytime. The service is available for clients worldwide and you can start communicating in just under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. BetterHelp is not the right solution for you if you have thoughts of hurting yourself or others. There are other numbers that I list in the show notes that you can go to for those services. With BetterHelp, you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Quote, after counseling with Jennifer Dressler for three weeks on issues concerning depression, stress, anxiety, and trauma, I really appreciate Jennifer's empathy and kindness. I feel heard and supported and she has offered some really helpful practices. End quote. Another BetterHelp user, quote, after counseling with Michelle Solo for two weeks on issues concerning depression, stress, anxiety, addictions, and self-esteem, Michelle and I have just begun communicating, and already I have boundless hope for my future. She's very tool-oriented and doesn't just listen. I've never before had a therapist who is so actively involved in taking steps to help you get better. I would highly recommend her, especially for those who have lost faith in therapy. I did. She's going to surprise you. So please visit betterhelp.com forward slash Leo. That's better H-E-L-P and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. I have a special offer for my Before You Kill Yourself listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash Leo. Today's guest is Dr. Julie Schwartz Gottman, who is an American clinical psychologist, researcher, speaker, and author. Together with her husband and collaborator, John Gottman, she is the co-founder of the Gottman Institute, an organization dedicated to strengthening relationships through research-based products and programs. She is the co-creator of the Sound Relationship House Theory, Gottman Method Couples Therapy, and the Art and Science of Love Weekend Workshop for Couples, among other programs. In addition to her internationally recognized clinical work, Julie Schwartz Gottman is the author of, or co-author of, six books, one including the newly released Eight Dates Essential, Eight Dates, God damn it, Eight Dates, Essential Conversations for a Lifetime of Love. In today's episode, we discuss the trauma that couples face, how to find someone you trust, and why you should talk during sex. This was such a fun episode. You're going to enjoy it from beginning to end. And remember, if you're struggling to find meaning, purpose, or just connect with yourself or the people around you, go to thrivewithleo.com for one-on-one coaching with yours truly. Let's get to tomorrow together. With that said, let's jump into the episode. Uh, I love it. I love it. I'm excited to have you on, uh, Julie. And, um, you know, I've been watching your videos and, and taking copious amount of notes. I just want to be able to use the word copious. Um, oh, okay. 
got it. It's multi-syllables. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, your work with couples who are facing trauma, um, mm. w- where did that begin? God, what a great question, Leo. Um, well, it started in about 1972 uh, when I was in grad school. Um, no, actually, I just finished college. That was it. And uh, at the time, Vietnam was going on, and I helped to create a – a uh, counseling drop-in center in Colorado Springs, Colorado, where I was in school. Uh, and lots and lots of people would drop in there. And of course, I didn't know anything. I was pretty young. But I uh, would talk to folks along with other people doing so. Uh, and those folks were heading off to Vietnam. They were coming back from Vietnam, severely traumatized. People were also getting raped by some of the uh, Fort Carson GIs, unfortunately, that were close by. Uh, So there was lots of trauma in the air, and I was helping with that. Then in grad school, uh, I focused in on trauma. Uh, But also after college, uh, between that and grad school, I moved to Boston. And in Boston, I worked with heroin addicts, all of whom were traumatized. Uh, And I worked with uh, people who were black and Hispanic in uh, Roxbury, which at the time was the quote unquote ghetto for folks of color who were poor. Lots of trauma there, too. Um, So I've worked individually with trauma forever, worked later with uh, Vietnam combat vets at the VA, uh, outpatient clinic in Skid Row, L.A., um, and then started working particularly with sexual abuse survivors, incest survivors, both men and women, uh, and continue to this day to be doing that along with the couple's work. Wow. I'm glad you brought up the the fact when you talked about sexual abuse, that it was both men and women. Because when I looked at the stats, the number of men who have undergone sexual abuse is extremely high, almost comparable to that of, of women. But it's not often talked about. And I would imagine that type of trauma shows up in a relationship in ways that we can't imagine. Yeah, you know, that's really true, Leo. Um, So I've treated a number of couples as well as individual uh, men where the men have been sexually abused. And many times in relationships, they haven't shared it with their partners, men or women. Uh, And the trauma is horrendous. It affects their trust levels. It affects their ability to be emotionally present. Uh, particularly during sex with their partners. And they, too, will have uh, lots of post-traumatic stress disordered symptoms in the sexual arena with their partners. Uh, And the partners have no idea what's going on. And sometimes the men don't either. They don't understand their own responses and how that and their earlier abuse may be linked. So part of the work is to create that bridge between the probably young part of themselves that was traumatized and the adult part that's now in a current relationship and help them integrate those two together and not feel ashamed. You know, when I had a couples therapist, she had me journaling and she would have me journal with my non-dominant hands. uh, And the idea was that my non-dominant hand represented uh, the younger version of myself, the nine-year-old version. And so I would ask myself a question and then journal with both hands to see what the re- how the responses were different. Mm-hmm. When you talked about bridging the link between their younger traumatized self and their older self, uh, what are some of the methods or strategies or, or techniques that you have for that? Uh, within a couple relationship or individually? Uh, uh, individually, we could do both, individually mm-hmm. and couples. But, you know, because we're, we're talking about how men um, undergo uh, sexual trauma and they're not even aware of how it's showing up. And so part mm-hmm. of it is bringing awareness. So 
I, I would mm-hmm. I would ask for both. Sure. Uh, So individually, um, and actually it'll come up during an individual assessment session when I'm working with a couple too. Um, But individually, I first, I don't push anything. You have to build trust. You have to build a safe environment. Uh, And I look for signs and they'll be very, very subtle. I'll ask them about eventually about their intimate relationships about uh, how things are going in the bedroom. Uh, and what I'll often see are very subtle signs, like the flutter of their eyes, uh, quick eyelid shutting, uh, turning away, moment of silence. Their chest will freeze, which means they're holding their breath, and that's a way to suppress emotion. And I'll ask them, is something going on right now? Um, and they may say no, and I don't want to push it, so I'll let it go. Um, and I might share with them, well, I just noticed this particular uh, signal, uh, and you do not have to talk about it now, but perhaps later when you feel safer, maybe you could share what was coming up for you in that moment. And we build safety first. That's crucial. Then um, I may look for openings in terms of their bringing up the subject. And it may sound like this. You know, I had a really bad night last night. I couldn't sleep. Okay, and what was going on for you? Well, I just kept having this fragment of being in a room with a very, very tall person. Was the person male or female? Well, usually male. Uh, what was happening? Etc. How old were you? Etc. Um, and they'll they'll probably have blocked out something like where was their uh, head uh, in relation to the male's body? And I'll ask little questions that draw them closer and closer. And finally, I might. Or they might say something like, you know, I think I was with this guy who had tan pants and I remember his pants were unzipped. And I can't breathe. I'm choking. I'm choking. God, there's something in my mouth. What is in your mouth? And then the story comes out. So it's very tender, delicate work, and you never want to push the boundaries on an individual who has that kind of history because there, there's so much that accompanies the remembering of an abuse that the person really has to be prepared for that rocky road that then follows. I love that you mentioned build safety first. And I would imagine in the context of a relationship, if one spouse wants the other spouse to open up or to share things, they also have to build safety first. How do we do that within the context of a relationship? Um, The partner who uh, wants the other person to disclose information needs to be very patient as well as very, very reassuring over and over and over again, reassuring that he or she really wants to hear what happened. Can I give you an example, Leo? Please. Okay. So I had a couple where the gentleman had been a Navy SEAL. He still was a Navy SEAL um, in special ops. He had been deployed 12 times uh, and he was 33 years old. So imagine. (laughs) And he'd gone to places like Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. And he never talked to his wife about what happened. Uh, And I encouraged her to to ask him, why don't you want to tell me? And she did so. And he replied, which is a typical response. You know, I just I I don't want to burden you. I don't want to traumatize you with what I went through. Uh, 
And she said, look, I can take it. I'm tough. I'm strong. I knew what we were getting into when you went into the Marines. It's all right. I can take it. Well, she had to say that many, 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 many times. Um, And finally, finally, uh, with some therapeutic help, he was able to surface what had what he had done uh, on one of those operations. Only one thing, and this was more mild for him, uh, where he shot a whole family in a car and killed them all, and they were just an innocent family um, with kids. Uh, it was just. A horrendous story. And he sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. You know, he couldn't bear the pain earlier. But once he knew she'd be there for him, that she wouldn't blame him, she wouldn't think he was a monster, which he thought of for himself, then he finally could share it. It's amazing the things we don't share with our partners, not because we were hiding something, but because mm-hmm. we don't want to be a burden to them. We don't want to overwhelm them. Right. But, but what ends up happening, it sounds like, is that it it builds a, a level of, of distrust and a lack of intimacy within the relationship because we're withholding a part of ourselves. Yes. Oh, very precise. That's exactly right, Leo. It's exactly right. You know, you have a, a part of yourself, uh, call it, you know, the closet, And you're stuffing things into that closet. But what you don't realize is that when you stuff the pain, you stuff the anger, you're stuffing all your emotions because they're all interconnected so that you eventually seem to be a bit of a zombie connecting or not connecting with your partner. And your partner doesn't know who you are anymore, nor how to relate to you, which is terribly painful for both people. They both end up feeling very much alone. That's why it's so important to try to share traumas with your partner, provided you have a good trusting relationship. And I would imagine that a lot of that, because I know for me, part of what makes it challenging to share traumas, uh, emotional experiences, is the history of sharing traumas and emotional experiences. And the trust has been broken uh, mm-hmm. you know, whether it was in my childhood or before. And I would imagine a lot of people come into relationships with a history of, of sharing a part of themselves only to have it um, used against them or weaponized or, to, mm-hmm. you know, to be shamed. And mm-hmm. so there's that fear of, you know, is this going to happen again if I share this? Oh, gosh, that is so true. You're very insightful, Um, especially when it comes to sexual abuse. Um, For one thing, uh, men won't tell a soul. They won't tell anybody as young kids uh, because there's, if possible, even more shame for a man uh, or a male child to have been sexually abused. Um. And that shame has to do with the prototype of what it means to be male. You're supposed to be strong, autonomous, independent, defending yourself, you know, powerful, vigilant, et cetera, et cetera. Well, how do you do that as a five-year-old kid, right? You can't. Um, nonetheless, the child blames himself. Then when he discloses it, if he dares to a parent, uh, or a a girl does that as well, um, oftentimes the parents aren't going to believe the kids, especially if it's something where the parent or the caretaker really respects, uh, the adult that's being accused of this. It might be a priest or a minister or a rabbi or uh, it could be an uh, uncle or a grandfather or a grandmother or, you know, some close individual to the family, a good friend, a coach. Uh, And the parent has such an alliance with that adult perpetrator that no way in the world are they going to see the perpetrator as as who they really are. 
uh, because that person is a friend or relative. So the kid is disbelieved and that's it. The iron gate comes down, the child shuts down and never trusts another soul to tell it. So one in adulthood has to be incredibly careful about a partner you pick who is somebody you really can trust, who you know is going to have your back, is going to be there for you. It's only then that there's a chance you might open up about your trauma. How do we, how do we pick a partner that we can trust? Is there is there like a five? Is there a, like a questionnaire we can hand out? Is it is there <laughs> is there like a, a a tarot card reading? What how do we pick? <laughs> Go to your neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Don't uh, don't trust necessarily what people say. You really want to trust what they do. So here are some of the simple cues as to whether or not somebody is trustworthy. First of all, uh, do they call when they say they're going to call? Do they show up when they say they're going to show up? Do they call you if they're going to be late? How about when you're sick? Do they help you out? When you're depressed, are they still there for you and wanting to talk? When you're happy and triumphant, do they want to celebrate with you? Do they take joy in your achievements or accomplishments? How about if you're really stressed out about something in your life? Will they listen to you with just empathy and curiosity rather than trying to fix the problem for you? Those are some of the ways that you can really see how does somebody really fit with what you're needing in terms of trusting another individual. What I love about what you mentioned is that when we typically think of trust, we think about infidelity, we think about theft, we think about cheating, uh, but rarely do we think about, do you celebrate my wins with me? Are you, are you overjoyed when... Uh, you know, I receive good news and want to be a part of that because that is, like you said, that is a part of trust of can I trust you to be there for me emotionally, not just for the, the good times, but for the bad times and vice versa. Um, because there's nothing worse than coming home. You imagine a kid and they got an A on the report card and then the, the parents are nonchalant or indifferent to it. And the same would be for a spouse. So now the kid learns to not be able to trust you emotionally or trust themselves emotionally because they're excited, you're not, and now there's a, a disconnect. So I love mm -hmm. that you mentioned that because that's a way that we don't typically think about trust is can I trust you with all of the emotions? That's right. That's right. So, you know, the basic question, Leo, is just are you there for me? Are you there for me when? When this happens, that happens, etc. Are you there for me? So you're right. I mean, inf infidelity is a big betrayal. We want our partners to be loyal and so on. But there's so many other ways that trust can either be fulfilled or broken. And you have to look for those too. And so I would imagine also it's not if the person isn't there for you, it's not that they're a bad person. It's just that you two aren't a good match. Am I correct in saying that? It's not so much <laughs> there's something wrong with the person. It's just you two aren't, you know, they're not be, they able to give you what you need. Well, let's that that can be fundamentally true. But let's look at the other half of the equation, which is really important. You have to say what you need. You have to be able to be very clear about what you need and to do so without criticism. Your partner cannot read your mind. So if you're judging them about whether or not they're there for you, but you haven't let them know how they can be there for you, then, you know, they're left in the dark. They don't know how to be there for you because you haven't told them so. And what's really important is to say what you do need as opposed to what you don't need. 
So let me give you an example. Um, You can either say, you know, I wish you'd stop leaving the kitchen such a big mess. We call that a negative need. Instead, you could say, would you please clean up the kitchen tonight? That would make me feel great. I'm tired. Okay, that's a positive need. You're telling your partner how your partner can shine for you. And that's worth its weight in gold. I love that. Uh, that idea of telling a person what you do want from them ex- uh, instead of what you don't want from them is mm-hmm. uh, planting that seed and, and also not expecting them to get it the first time, right? We're mm. oh, a, so a part true. of a relationship <laughs> is, is learning about each other. And it takes time. It took me forever to learn algebra and I still don't know how to do algebra. And I had. <laughs> <laughs> You're a verbal kind of guy, Leo. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Yeah, it does take a long time sometimes uh, to learn. You know, a a classic example is when you share something that's stressful for you. Let's say it's about your job. It's about your boss, something like that. You share that with your partner and your partner immediately leaps in and says, you know what I think you ought to do? I think you ought to just, you know, sit down, talk with your boss, tell your boss, et cetera, et cetera. So your partner gives you a solution. Well, did you ask for one? No. Your partner was just trying to be helpful. Their intentions were good. They were trying to take away your misery by creating a a channel you could navigate to get out of that misery with the boss. But what you may have been needing instead, which we've found in our research to be true, is to just feel less alone with the stress you're feeling. So your partner being empathetic, just saying, oh, that must have really sucked. That must have felt horrible. That is going to do a whole lot more good for the partner than offering a solution. And offering a solution, if the partner hasn't asked for it, can feel to the speaker like, what, you don't think I'm smart enough to figure this out myself? That's not what I'm looking for. So you go with empathy there. Well, it can take a while to figure that out, especially if your partner hasn't coached you on what they need when they're sharing their stress. It takes time to figure this stuff out. I, I love that's exactly what it is. You know, me and my girl, uh, there are times where I'm like, I just need you to feel me right now. I don't need I don't need a <laughs> fixing. I don't need you to, to pull out the old tool belt. I just I just need you to be like that sucks. That's it. That's all I need you <laughs> to say. It. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yes. Universally, that sucks is one of the best things you can say to your partner. It covers everything. It covers you feeling angry, sad, afraid. It's perfect. I love that. And 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 to go back just a little bit, you know, because we started off talking about trauma and, and we were talking more about individual trauma. When, when there's a, a trauma that the couple undergoes, say uh, the loss of a child um, mm-hmm. or even a, a job loss, it doesn't have to be anything like that. Are there stages of trauma, of, of coping with trauma, like the stages of grief? So there aren't really clear stages to trauma, but the first, the first thing that really happens is shock, numbing, uh, just you know, you're staring off into space with glazed over eyes, typically. Uh, The whole world has cracked open and everything has become disorienting, confusing, bewildering. Uh, Nothing makes sense. That's often the first response to trauma. What follows then are some big emotional roller coasters, typically, where People will have whatever it is, big moments of terror or anger or being easily startled. Um, They may have uh, fits of rage, uh, especially during a moment where they feel out of control uh, because trauma has to do with feeling out of control and not having control. Um, 
there can be all kinds of feelings that come up and then they get numbed when uh, and then they come up again. So the hardest thing is to ride those waves of huge, big emotions followed by numbing by big emotions and numbing. Uh, And you have to watch out for your own compulsive behavior like drinking, drugging, uh, sex addiction, binge eating, starving. Uh, there's lots of ways, uh, you know, running 15 miles a day, every day. Um, uh, those behaviors are ways of stuffing down the trauma and the feelings. And that's perfectly normal. One has to watch out for those growing into a uh, habit that uh, is very hard to stop. Eventually, the best thing is to find an individual, whether it's a friend, it's a relative, it's a therapist, a counselor, somebody who can listen to what happened to you and be there for you emotionally as you talk about it. And you have to talk about it and live the details over and over and over again, which is really hard to do. It takes time. Um, uh, with the love and compassion and support of an individual that you do trust. Do you find that one of the biggest uh issues in a relationship when there's trauma is that they're cycling through the, the different uh, levels emotionally at different times. One person might be uh, feeling numb and the other one is in rage. And that's where most of the conflict comes from as opposed to really just the trauma itself. Hmm. Uh, that's, that is certainly one scenario uh, where the conflict can emerge. Um, What I've seen, however, is that uh, people get triggered. Um, One or the other will be triggered by something. The other person doesn't know what happened in the relationship. Uh, And all of a sudden that triggered person is on the floor the other person doesn't know what to do uh, and does the wrong things at that point doesn't know what to do Um, tons of examples of that Uh, one is mm, somebody you know a combat vet hears a helicopter overhead it's the weatherman you know looking at the weather but he thinks it's a helicopter about to shoot him down he dives under the table a uh, partner goes under the table and says what the hell is the matter with you what's wrong with you get out of there this is you're not in vietnam anymore you're not in korea anymore get out of there well the guy is he is in vietnam Right. That's exactly where he is. That's what happens with traumatic memory. Another classic example is if one partner has been sexually abused and the other person uh, wants to have sex with them, initiate sex. Everything's going just dandy until the person touches some part of their body that triggers a memory of their earlier sexual abuse that first partner's sexual abuse. And all of a sudden they turn off, they freeze, they start sobbing, they may curl up in fetal position. And the other person uh, who touched them is flabbergasted and bewildered and thinks they did something wrong. And then they blame the other person for being frigid or cold or not loving them or something. I mean, conflicts can occur from the uh, trigger happening within uh just normal everyday life i completely get that i have something about people putting their hand on my back and Mm -hmm. not that i've been you know sexually abused but i don't know what it stems from i haven't i haven't quite tapped into it yet but there's something about the hand on the back to me that says that um like um manipulating you in a way or 
I, <laughs> I'm presenting one way, but I'm going to do something else. It, like it, it just brings up mm-hmm. feelings of, of, of mm. distrust. And, mm. uh, and I, and I share that, you know, with, with people, I go, I ah, don't, no, no, don't do that. Cause I'm not, I remember when I was being recruited for football and some of the coaches mm-hmm. would put their hand mm-hmm. on mine. I'm like, I'm not coming here. I just, I would oh. immediately shut down. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, who knows what might have happened, um, but anybody touching your back that you don't know is, you know, your back is vulnerable. You can't see behind you. You don't have eyes in the back of your head. You don't know what that person's going to do. And a hand on the back is oftentimes somebody trying to be uh, you know, we're buddies, we're buddies, I'll, I'll pat you on the back or touch you on the back, but they're not, they're not, they're going to trick you. They're going to betray you. They're going to use you. They're going to abuse you, you know, whatever it is. So you got to think about every time somebody touched you on the back or hit you on the back or, you know, made nice with you by doing that, then what happened? Because whatever happened after that wasn't okay. It wasn't. It was bad. And you put them together. You link those two together. Somebody's going to hurt me, do something wrong to me, whatever it is. But they're trying to be nice and be pals with me. Uh Uh-uh. Not going to trust it. So... It's really good to advise people of things like that, (laughs) you know, rather than freaking out and, okay, no, no, because people aren't going to know. They're not going to know, right? And I'm sure, you know, as an African-American man, especially if the person who's touching you is maybe white, uh, maybe male, I mean, how much trust is there, right? Who knows? I mean, there may be some. Uh, depending on the individual, of course, but overall, you've got in your bones the history. You've got 400 years of history in your bones that say, watch out, man. Watch out, watch out. Be careful. So somebody getting too close too fast is going to feel dangerous. Yeah, I was was reading somewhere and they talked about the they didn't call it evolutionary traumas, but uh, as Mm -hmm. you mentioned, the trauma in the bones, do Mm -hmm. we really carry the trauma of our, of our ancestors with us? And can you speak to that? Oh God, yes. Multi-generational trauma is what we call it. But, you know, sometimes it's, it's all kinds of stuff. Um, and yes, we carry it in our bones. No question about it. It, it, it. It's like it almost alters our DNA, our DNA in some way. So uh, take women, for example. Uh, and we've tried this experiment um, in a large group, let's say 500 people, uh, men and women mostly, um, We'll ask a question, how, how many men in this room feel fear when you walk into an underground parking structure? And, you know, a few men will raise their hands, but most men won't. How many women feel fear? 95% will raise their hands of women. So... Women have been chattel, have been raped, have been uh, used, have been sold, have been enslaved, have been uh, sexually abused uh, out in the public eye or secretly for millennia, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And so women have a much higher radar to pick up danger and fear uh, in general than males. Now, my guess, I don't know this, but I would guess that African-American men and women in this country have a similar thing, both men and women. 
because they're coming from that 400 years of terrible, terrible abuse, terrible abuse uh, and prejudice and racism and everything and lynching, everything else, slavery. So they carry it in their bones, too. And of course, it exists to this day. So, you know, rightfully so they carry it. It's not just about the past. They carry that that watch out, that danger. Uh, I'm a Jew. Well, as a Jew, you know, uh, 80 years ago, six million of us were wiped out, were killed. Uh, And that goes back, I mean, back at least 4,000 years. Uh, We have a history of persecution and being killed and in all kinds of great things. So as Jews, we carry it, too. We carry that multi-generational trauma that um, always, you know, leaves us hyper vigilant, looking for danger. Where is it? That's part of the the outcome of multi-generational trauma. And and being aware of that, how do we use that to also help us heal and and work through the, the trauma as individuals, but even as couples to say, Hey, here's my, you know, one of the things me and Michelle did is because my girlfriend is, she's Jewish also and mm. uh, Russian Good Ashkenazi. Taste. Yeah. Good taste. <laughs> she's Russian Ashkenazi? Yeah, yeah. That's Ashkenazi. Even yeah. better taste. That's what I am. Good. <laughs> so, you know, Good she doesn't have, uh, you know, she's not aware of all the things that have happened, uh, you know, on my mm. side generationally. And so, you know, we've discussed it, but also like reading articles, watching movies, et cetera, et cetera. And Mm -hmm. just to help inform why maybe on some days I might be a little more uh, fragile Mm -hmm. than other days, depending on, Mm -hmm. you know, the political climate, what's going on in the world and uh, why certain things are I am more sensitive to. But also Mm -hmm. I realized for me, it's like I don't know everything that's happened, you know, the Jewish history, you know, is concentration camps. And then, you know, today, and then I realized like I have to read more about her history and where, you know, she's come from. And, and, you know, so I, you know, to go in that direction so that we understand all the parts that make up who we are today. And, uh, instead of, you know, just the way you get more of a 360 perspective. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> That's really true. You know, <clears throat> uh, people who are black in this country and Jews have a shared history of slavery. So, oops, shoot, hold on. So, we have a shared history of slavery. So, you can go back to, uh, we're thinking around 2000 BC. And Jews were the slaves of the pharaohs of that time. There were thousands of Jews who were the slaves of Pharaoh. And uh, the slavery was horrible, Um, similar in some ways to what African people who were stolen from Africa uh, to work here in this country and build the wealth of their landowner masters. Uh, It's very, very similar history. So so if you go back far enough, there is that shared history uh, between uh, Jewish history and African American history. So you have a lot more in common with your girlfriend than you think. And she carries that history in her bones just like you do. And I think this is valuable for listeners out there of, you know, what I think what we're really saying here is not just look at you and how you grew up in your household, but, you know, take time to explore your history and your cultural history and your ethnic history. And um, because it gives you more context as to maybe why you do some of the things that you do. My, you know, my sister um, just discovered that some of the patterns she's carrying out in her relationships didn't just stem from our mom, but from where my mom grew up, her community Mm -hmm. was how they Mm -hmm. interacted a certain way with relationships. 
And so that kind of gave her a richer context and made her feel at less alone as as we you know mentioned earlier. It's like we all have this we want to feel connected in some way for good or mm-hmm. bad. We just want to mm-hmm. know that we're not the only ones uh, doing what we're doing. And mm-hmm. and so, you know, I did, the, I took the 23 and me and that gave me, you know, like I'm like mostly uh, uh, Ghanaian or Ghanaian. I'm not sure how, how you pronounce it. Africa, uh, mm-hmm. Nigerian, mm-hmm. but also have Scottish and Irish blood in me. Um, mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. uh, that informs uh, a lot of, you know, how I think about myself uh, as I move throughout the world and, and some of my personality uh, characteristics. Um, so there's something empowering about finding ways to connect yourself to a bigger picture instead of the myopic view of just I, I, I. Yeah, you know, that's so true, Leo. You know, and the beautiful thing about that is that, you know, a lot of times, especially, I don't know, in today's therapeutic climate, we, you know, blame our fathers or our mothers or grandparents or something like that. Uh, But looking further back than that really allows us to have compassion for our our uh, predecessors who grew up with a tremendous amount of hardship. I can give you an example from my own life. Um, My mom was uh, alcoholic. She was also a drug addict uh, at times and very, you know, just not the mother you would want to have, God bless her. Uh, But uh, she started telling me stories when I was, I don't know, eight, nine or 10, somewhere in there about how she had been incested by her father. She had been incested for years. She was probably sexually molested in a boarding house, uh, when her mother tried to leave her father and took her with her. Uh, and, She watched her father beat the heck out of her mother. So, you know, my poor mother, excuse me, was so traumatized she couldn't see straight. And she didn't get the help that she really needed to deal with that trauma. So she tried stuffing it and stuffing it and stuffing it. That's what all the alcohol and drugs and so on were all about. And it, so finding out that kind of information really helps you to feel more compassion for the human being that that caretaker was. They weren't just bad or good, a villain or a hero. They were a human being. Do we see gender differences in how a couple handles trauma? Uh... Yes, I'd say so. Um, But they're pretty generalized. Uh, And, of course, you know, these days gender is more fluid. And so, you know, people are mixtures of male and female at times. Um, But in general, with a grain of salt, men tend to act out their trauma out in the world. So let's say a fellow was, let's just take sexual abuse. He was sexually abused. Okay. So he has felt like a victim most of his life. Well, how's he going to deal with that? He'll do the opposite out in the world. He'll be belligerent. He'll try to be domineering. He'll be very, very controlling. He won't let anybody control him. Uh, And he'll be an angry individual out there. That's, again, that's just conjecture. A woman who's been sexually abused is going to act inwards versus the male acting outward. She'll act inward. She'll be more self-destructive. She'll uh, maybe drug or drink more. She'll um, withdraw. She'll sabotage any relationship she can have. She'll be massively depressed and withdrawn. Um, she's taking herself out of the world. That is, a, you know, again, those are stereotypes. I need to say this very clearly because people of 
the opposite genders here could be doing these same behaviors. Um, but in general, that's what we see, especially in young kids, teenagers, and so on. When we talk about traumas, we usually think about major traumas, sexual abuse, uh, neglect. Are there, are there more subtle traumas that take place that we really wouldn't be aware of and, and, until we had somebody help us piece it together? Yeah, there are. Um, small things uh, could be, for example, a little fender bender, you know, car accident. That can be traumatizing. Going to a doctor and hearing a diagnosis that's serious, like cancer, but uh, the doctor says it with absolute coldness in 30 seconds and walks out of the room. That's a trauma. Uh, it can be something like a teacher humiliating you in front of a class. That's a trauma. A friend who turns their back on you when you really needed them. That can be a trauma. Uh, of course, bullying is a trauma, but even a day of bullying out of your whole life can be a trauma. So uh, a boss calling you out in front of uh, some other employees, that can be a trauma. There's, there's all kinds of traumas. Anything, here's how you define trauma, anything that happens to you that was unpredictable and that left you feeling out of control of your environment and uh, hurt or frightened or anguished in some way. That's a trauma. It can be little. It can be big. That sounds like a movie I watched last night. Uh-oh. What'd you watch, <laughs> Leo? What'd you watch? <laughs> no, but I, you know, I was just thinking, yeah, I used to be a huge fan of Law & Order SVU, um, huh? and I have no idea how they – keep going apparently we as a society love to be traumatized over and over again because it's been going <laughs> on for like 30 seasons and is nothing but uh you know uh victims and attackers i mean that's really what you're watching that that dynamic uh play out on both sides which is why i stopped watching it but um but there because you know i, I learned that the brain and and tell me if this is true but it can't determine the difference between something that is uh, that's actually happened and something that we imagine to have happened. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. God, you know, that is so true. <laughs> Drives me nuts. If I watch a TV show uh, that has, I don't know, some really strong character in it, who's either, you know, whatever, a victim or a persecutor or a nasty person or whatever, I'll take on the role of that person without even knowing it. And afterwards, I'll treat John just like that character would treat somebody on the show. And it's like, what? Where did that come from? <laughs> you know, it's just like very strange. But, you know, what what we're doing there when we want to watch something that is traumatizing over and over and over again, there's a there's a human need, there's a drive to master past trauma. And so you'll keep recreating it, recreating it over and over and over again, whether it's by watching something that mimics it or actually traumatizing yourself, you know, setting yourself up to get traumatized in some way. But this time you're going to be in control. This time you're going to be the master of what happens with the TV. You can turn it off, right? You're the master. You're in control. But we keep exposing ourselves to that trauma, trying to reverse what the original trauma was, which entailed being out of control. This time, we're going to be the ones in control. So that's why folks who've been traumatized will want to see murder and mayhem on TV or in the movies over and over and over again. And, and so that seems like not the best way to heal or work through the trauma but it sounds like a, a step, like, for, you know, first you, you'd want to see that so that you feel in control. Is there what would be an alternative to that? Because I would imagine 
a person turns to that when they in their life feel out of control. And then this is a way for them to get that. It's almost like with the eating and mm -hmm. other addictions, we're just looking at to regain some control in our lives. What would be the alternative to that then? Talk about your trauma. <laughs> Simple as that. Talk about your trauma with somebody you trust over and over and over again. Allow yourself to go into the details of it. Remember it. Feel uh, some of it as you get strong enough to do so. Uh, and realize, because this is always the cornerstone in every trauma, realize that, number one, the world is not all bad. It's not all a dangerous, terrible place. There's always also good things in the world and good people in the world. And you may not have control over everything. You may not be, you know, the world's best person in the whole wide world, you know, guilt free. But you're good enough. You're a good enough person. You survive this trauma. And best of all, top that off with how can I use this pain to help other people? Create growth from it. Create growth. There's a, a fabulous guy named Tedeschi who is a professor at, I think, University of North Carolina. And he has studied post-traumatic growth, talking to some of the hardest hit, especially combat survivors. And he helps them to realize the moral quandary they were in when they committed acts of violence or were traumatized. And how can they use what they experienced to help other people and to grow themselves into a deeper, more profound, caring individual. So think about that part too. Use your pain to help other people. That's what maybe a lot of us are doing in this field. I love that. Use your pain to help other people. Mm -hmm. um, when And I, I, do you have a little extra time? I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about... When you say talk about it and, and talk about the pain, talk about the trauma, I'd imagine it goes back initially to when we, we talked about how sometimes you feel like you're being a burden to the other person. Is there, is there a way to talk about it so that it's, uh, how do I say this? So that it's, it's more, uh, it's, a, it's a healthier conversation or you feel more comfortable with expressing it because I would imagine there's also, you know, you hear if, if you, the more you talk about it, the more you're like re-traumatizing yourself because you keep bringing it up. It's like, oh, you're bringing that thing up again. Is there a way for us to, to talk about it and bring it up so it's, it's not that? I don't know if that question made sense. <laughs> well, I think you're asking two questions. Okay. One is how do you bring it up? with a partner and not burden them? And two, how do you talk about it over and over again and not re-traumatize yourself? Yes. Right? Beautiful. Okay. Okay. So with the first question, um, first of all, you get reassurance from your partner before you talk about it that it's okay to talk about it. Secondly, you plan a time to do so when neither of you are going to be subject to distractions and, you know, cut off of time. Um, so create a safe environment in which to talk about it. And third, ask your partner to signal you if they're starting to feel overwhelmed. And they can do that just with a hand signal. They can just use a timeout like you would do, you know, in a football game or a basketball game, just timeout. Uh, and you can pause there or stop there and just talk about what's going on in the moment right now with the other person. Um, so the other person can say, I'm just so overwhelmed right now. I just, geez, you know, let me take a break here, uh, take a few breaths, and then we could continue. So you, you know 
you know, you're not responsible for your partner creating a boundary past which they are getting overwhelmed. It's up to your partner to create that boundary and you will respect it. That's that's step one. How do you deal with a trauma in talking to your partner about it? The second question, how do you, how do you avoid re-traumatizing yourself when you bring up a, a trauma? You know, the reality is you don't re-traumatize yourself. That's a myth, actually. What's true is that the more you talk about it, the less powerful it becomes. Edna Foa who is a a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous psychologist who has studied trauma for 30 years, has seen this uh, in her research. She's done very, very careful research. um, And part of her methods are called prolonged exposure. And prolonged exposure means you're bringing up the trauma over and over again in different ways. And even if you can go to the place where you were traumatized and stand there and look and feel and be in the environment where it occurred and realize it's no longer happening, you got through it, you survived it, you're on the other side of it, that's an opportunity to feel your own strength and power as opposed to your uh, victimhood and vulnerability. Wow, that that was very powerful. Thank you so much for sharing. You're that. welcome. You're welcome. And you know, for the listeners out there who you know they're in, they're in a relationship and they they're working through the trauma, and and like we talked about earlier, sometimes it can show up in the in the bedroom. A lot of couples I know have over time they. They've lost the passion. And and when they say they've lost the passion or they're not really feeling it, how do couples reconnect, um, you know, get that passion back? Or or may, is it about getting the passion back or is it about maintaining the passion? Hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, not related to trauma, but not, just a general right, question? Right, just, just in general. Yeah. And, well, and, and I bring it up because... You know, for a couple that is going through trauma, I would imagine that, that sometimes it could create space between the two people, and now and then one person's ready to become more physical again, and mm-hmm. maybe the other person's not, or over time the trauma just created like a huge amount of space, and they haven't had. Mm-hmm. You know, I have friends who haven't had sex in like six months or a year, and and I don't know <laughs> if there's trauma involved, but I would yeah. imagine that there is on some level that's been unspoken about Mm, try 20 years i've seen some couples like that so yeah there's a way that you have to rekindle connection so first of all you got to make sure that you both feel emotionally safe both feel emotionally safe and connected you never try to have sex when you're emotionally disconnected, that's going to trigger trauma, actually, uh, especially that of a sexual nature. Secondly, you want to be able to really talk during sex. If you can't talk during sex, you're in trouble. So you just want to be able to converse about, does this feel good? Does that feel good? How firm should my touch be? Where should I touch you? Where should I not touch you? Etc. Now, one of the ways of really starting all of this is what we call sensate focus or sensual pleasuring, where one person is a receiver, one person's a giver. And the giver is touching the individual in the safest places for that individual. And uh, the receiver is giving the giver feedback about, does this, you know, it feels good here, doesn't feel good there, a little firmer, a little softer, a little more tender, slow down, etc. So you start with the non-erotic zones and then slowly move towards what the other person is, the receiver that is, is comfortable with. 
in moving towards more and more erotic touch, but you build the trust non-erotically first through emotion and through touch, but touch that feels safe. And as there's safety, you can eventually move to to more and more eroticism. The other thing, too, is that um, the receiver needs to stop everything in a heartbeat. They need to pay attention to the signals inside them to where if they start feeling anxious, they stop it. And the giver needs to be able to say, okay, let's stop. What else can we do right now to help you feel safe and connected? And that goes for the bedroom too. So being able to stop gracefully and the person who is really into it, doesn't want to stop, needs to accept stop with graciousness, then you've got more and more safety. And within safety, you can build relaxation. And the more relaxation there is with sex, the more passion is safe to emerge. Whoa, the talking during sex. I I didn't realize that that was a uh, uh, requirement. It's not the right word. But like how how healthy that is and how helpful that is. Uh, you think, betcha. You know, especially as a guy, like I'm like I should know what I'm doing, so I'm not gonna ask her. You know, <laughs> just of course it does. Oh. You know, I'm 44. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh and, yeah, poor. You know. I, you know, I feel so sorry for men and lesbian women who feel like you know they got to know everything. They got to be the perfect performer. It's such terrible pressure for you guys to bear. It's awful. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. There's no Yelp reviews, you know, in this area. So you just kind <laughs> of like you, you, you're like. <laughs> <laughs> You're like nobody's running out the bedroom, so I guess I'm, I'm, you know everything is good. You just I'm doing fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing good. yay, yay for me. <laughs> you know, one of the things I loved, uh, I was watching one of your videos, and because we both know that sex starts outside the bedroom, um, mm-hmm. and you talked about one of the most important things for a relationship is uh, for the man to accept the woman's influence and for the woman to share responsibility for issues in the relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I was like, Oh my God, that that's so huge. Like I was like, I think you just tapped into men's Viagra is like just (laughs) just a woman to say she's sorry uh, or like I'm responsible. Also, I was just like, Oh yeah, that, that, that would, that's a huge turn on right there. Yes, it is. Absolutely. You know, all of us, have a tendency to be defensive. We all do. But, you know, typically women uh, in heterosexual relationships are the ones who bring up relationship issues. You know, they're kind of like the guardians of the relationship. And so they'll bring up uh, complaints or issues in order to make the relationship even better. Well, you know, poor guy doesn't know what to do with that. So he may get defensive. Uh, And... If she's just blaming him and just being critical of him, God, that's not going to work. It's going to backfire. So she needs to be able to say, you know, I know I'm part of this, too. You know, here's how I'm part of it. And wouldn't it be great if we could work on changing this together? Then you've got something going. I love that. Uh, Dr. Julie Gottman, is there anything that we haven't discussed that you think would be relevant to the listeners in regards to couples and, you know, facing trauma? (laughs) I'm sorry, Leo. All I can think about is the election uh, (laughs) and the Supreme Court and the trauma of what's happening here and now. So I think many of us uh, are living trauma day to day uh, and a lot of fear. But You know, the only thing I can say is talk, 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 talk to people that you love, that you trust, that you hope you can trust, 
um, and listen with your whole heart. Um, we like to say that um, probably the motto of a relationship should be, honey, if you're in pain, the world stops right now and I listen. Julie, thank you so much. Please tell listeners where they can uh, find you and, and work with you at the wonderful Gottman Institute. Mm-hmm. So we're at www.gottman, G-O-T-T-M-A-N dot com. Uh, and uh, that's probably the best place. Uh, we also have a million books. And one of our last books that's really been fabulous for COVID is called Eight Dates, Essential Conversations to a Lifetime of Love, or for a Lifetime of Love. And it gives you really cool topics in a series of wonderful deepening questions to talk about with your partners while you're sequestered at home. Um, that can really deepen and expand your relationships. It's so funny because uh, Michelle and I are in couples therapy right now, and uh, we asked our therapist for homework, and she sent us uh, two of your blog posts from uh, the Gottman Institute. Um, cool. Un- unbeknownst to us. <laughs> so I was like, oh, this is so funny. She sent it to us today. So we're just like, really? oh, how strange is that? Yeah. Wow, that's very cool. (laughs) I love it. Yeah, at the Institute, we have a lot of social media. We have what's called the Marriage Minute that gives a little tiny bit of advice about relationships uh, several times a week. So there's there's lots of stuff going on uh, that can help to support your relationships. And last question, I ask this of all my guests, because I always imagine there's one person listening in who may be on the precipice of ending their life. Before you kill yourself, what would you say to them, Julie? Reach out for help. Talk to somebody. Tell somebody what you're going through. Reach out for help. You're not alone. Find somebody and talk to them, whether it's on the phone, it's on the internet, it's in person safely talk to somebody you're not alone you feel like you are but ultimately you're not thank you so much julie thank you so much listeners for tuning in remember this podcast is not a substitute for going to get help for reaching out to someone call anyone there's the 1-800-SUICIDE or 1-800-273-TALK or if you're international, there are numbers listed in the show notes as, there are, as they are in every and all the show notes of international numbers. You can call, you can text. their are Facebook groups. Uh, you can go to thrivewithleo.com for one-on-one coaching with yours truly. Let's get to tomorrow together. Thank you so much, Julie. Mm, this has been a wonderful interview. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Leo. Thank you. Just a reminder, today's episode was brought to you by Better help because they want you to start living a happier life today, not tomorrow, not a month from now. Today, the service is available for clients worldwide. You can start communicating in just under 48 hours. They will match you with a licensed therapist. For me, I know the value of talking to someone. It's not always about a fix or a solution, it's really about feeling heard, feeling connected, feeling like I have an ally, a friend, someone who understands what I'm going through. BetterHelp will help you with that. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. As a matter of fact, if you put in betterhelp.com forward slash Leo, you get 10% off. That's right. That's my special offer for BYKY listeners is type in betterhelp.com forward slash Leo, L-E-O, and you can join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Go to betterhelp.com forward slash Leo today.